Next up, we have Latios. Latios is Latias' brother and one of the stars of the movie Pokemon Heroes. And spoiler alert, right now, you have exactly three seconds to click off of this. Latios heroically sacrifices itself at the end. Yeah, we gave you a spoiler alert, even though that movie is eons old. Ha, huh, get it? Eons, because Latios is the eon Pokemon? Okay, cool. It was also featured on Tobias's team in one of the most ridiculous battles in the Pokemon anime's history. Seriously, who pitched that? Who said, all right, Ash is gonna lose to a guy who has Darkrai and Latios because that makes sense. Where did he get both of those Pokemon? I have no idea. Maybe Tobias figured out how to use an action replay or something. And more importantly, who on the anime staff greenlit this? And of course, Latios is known for being the roaming Pokemon in Pokemon Ruby, where Latias is in Pokemon Sapphire. You could obtain Latios through the Southern Island event by getting the Eon ticket, if you had Pokemon Sapphire. Today, we're going to delve into Latios' competitive history. And so, we ask, how good was Latios actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Latios' debut generation saw it in Ubers, ruling the tier alongside its twin Latios. Latios wasn't as bulky as his sister, but still had natural defensive utility against the titans of the tier, Groudon and Kyogre, thanks to its decent bulk, tremendous typing, and incredible speed. Matter of fact, it was so fast for the tier that it could and did easily run a modest nature without missing out on anything that it beat with Timid, still outrunning even Rayquaza. The only faster Pokemon, Mewtwo and Deoxys Attack, were not good switch-ins, and Mewtwo had to self-destruct to actually one-hit KO Latios. That said, Latios did have to be more on the careful side when switching in, as it wasn't the hit-taking machine Latios was, and had to watch out for choice band hidden power ghosts in particular, as well as having less leeway for switching into Kyogre's Ice Beam. However, what Latios lacked in bulk, it more than made up for with sheer power. It was absolutely impossible to switch into safely without a Blissey, and even otherwise ridiculously bulky Pokemon like Registeel, Regice, and Jirachi struggled to take its mighty thunders with spikes down. Latios was so strong that it could rely on just Ice Beam and Thunder's coverage, Thunder being effectively as powerful as a stabbed Dragon Claw, which was just impossible to beat with any spikes immune Pokemon, and it had Refresh and Recover so that opponents couldn't beat it by wearing it down. This was also useful in helping it reliably counter Thunder Wave Kyogre and Groudon, who often attempted to paralyze it so they could bowl it over later in the match. However, Latios also had a ton of other amazing options. It could Calm Mind to raise its special attack to Nosebleed Heights. It could even run a pure attacking set to grab more one-hit KOs with its extra coverage. Hidden Power Fire crushed Steel types in the sun. Solar Beam was excellent for disintegrating even specially defensive Groudon and didn't exactly risk Kyogre switching in since Kyogre was terrified of Latios. The grass coverage allowed Latios to run Dragon Claw over Ice Beam, whose main use was Groudon. The stab dragon coverage allowed Latios to threaten other laddies even more while having a reliable attack to use in Sun, where Thunder's accuracy was cut to 50%. Latios could really run whatever it wanted, and it was so good that using it really had just about zero drawbacks. Many players even considered at least one of it or Latios mandatory on every competitive team due to how well they matched up against everything. The two even made for a tremendous pair. They didn't have to worry about their identical typing stacking weaknesses because they had nearly none. So overall, Latios was unquestionably one of the top two Pokemon in advanced Ubers. And given that its greater immediate power felt more in line with the general feel of the tier, it was considered by many to be number one. Latios wasn't as invincible in the fourth generation. It could be outsped more easily either by a plethora of Pokemon that could viably wield a Choice Scarf to strike it at its weak points, such as Garchomp, Dialga, Palkia, or even Kyogre, or even naturally without a Choice Scarf, by Pokemon like Darkrai, Mewtwo, who was now stronger thanks to Life Orb, and upon Platinum's release, Shaman Sky. Its weaker defense stat was also more easily preyed on, with Pursuit now being physical, Dragon Claw being physical and seen on most Groudon sets, and an influx of powerful priority, most notably Scizor's Bullet Punch, Giratina Origins Shadow Sneak, and Lucario's Extreme Speed. Even its nice special bulk from Soul Dew was cut into by the omnipresent Stealth Rock. However, make no mistake, though Latios was no longer the metagame's uncontested top dog, it was still incredibly dangerous. While the new generation had brought it hindrances, it had also given it a tremendous gift, an astronomically powerful stab move in the form of Draco Meteor. There were two kinds of Pokemon that could semi 
reliably tank it. Bulky Steel types and Blissey, and the Steels risk death from Latios' many coverage moves, while the offensive ones Scizor and Jirachi still took incredible amounts of damage from Draco Meteor. Speaking of coverage, Latios even got a nice boost in the form of Grass Knot, which was far superior to Solar Beam, as it allowed it to mow down both Kyogre and Groudon without worrying about weather, as well as function as a terrific tool against the newly specially defensive boosted Tyranitar. More generally, it was incredibly easy to use Latios. You just switch in, which wasn't difficult given that its natural bulk was still decent and its speed was still terrific, then use Draco Meteor and watch as everything fell apart, especially with spike support that could potentially overwhelm even Blissey. Latios made for an incredible pairing with Lucario, as Lucario could easily set up a Swords Dance on the super effective move, often choice moves that people use to revenge kill Latios with, and against stall teams, could switch in easily against a Blissey that Latios had forced to use soft boiled. Latios was a cornerstone of fast, offensive teams, as it was incredibly reliable at crushing opposing teams and letting its teammates pick up the pieces. Its defensive presence was vital for them as well, not just by virtue of what it switched into, but also by what it checked by outspeeding, as there were only a couple Pokemon faster than it. As such, it was one of Gen 4 Ubers' best Pokemon. And fun note, like Latias, Latios was considered for OU without its signature Soul Dew and tested in what was referred to as a suspect metagame, but it proved to be far too fast and strong for the tier to handle. Latio sped onto the VGC scene with all the impact you'd expect, using its blistering speed and special attacking prowess to assert itself as a top tier threat in the doubles metagame from its very first days. Although it's hard to find detailed records of what Latio sets did back in VGC's olden days, it's not hard to guess. It went fast and dropped Dracos. To be fair, Latios comes with a nice onboard selection of utility options, Tailwind, Icy Wind, Substitute, and even some weather setting moves. More on that later. But for the most part, Latios was good for one thing, going fast and hitting hard. Latios had its fair share of Gen 4 results, with Yasuhitsu Kajiwara taking it to second place at the first ever video game showdown before VGC was even a thing, and Allison Chambers giving it a world's top 8 appearance in 2010, placing 7th. From the outset, Latios made it clear, if you wanted a fast special attacking dragon, it was always going to be first class. Generation 5 came around and Latios finally became OU, without Soul Dew. It quickly established itself as an incredible Pokemon. The tier was faster than before, with additions like Garchomp and Terrakion, but Latios was faster still, and threatened just about everything with its Choice Specs Draco Meter. It was so powerful that even bulky Tyranitar struggled to switch in safely, while specially defensive Steel-types Ferrothorn and Jirachi had to worry about being crippled by Trick. Latios actually enjoyed having Ferrothorn around, because because it could use it on its own team to lay spikes that made it even more absurdly difficult to switch into, meaning it had to predict even less. It could just spam Draco Meteor, as its raw power accompanied by spikes would do a number on everything. Latios fit on sand and raid teams alike and was a consistent game-to-game -game nuke. While its nice special bulk and resistances gave it terrific defensive utility against rain and sun teams as well as being able to use its resistances and speed to pivot into offensive threats and snatch their momentum away, notably guard Chop or Dragonite's Earthquake. It was a great check to the dangerous Reuniclus as well, and was solid at threatening most burn spamming walls like Rotom Wash, Jellicent, Mew, and Sableye. Latios was also a key member of Dragon Spam. That style of team wanted Pokemon that could essentially get automatic KOs once Magnezone had trapped the opposing Steel type and little else could summon instant death the way Latios' Draco Meteor could. These kinds of teams could even use Dragon Dance Latios, which surprised its special wall checks Tyranitar and Jirachi with powerful boosted earthquakes and was immensely difficult to revenge kill, as it outran every choice scarfer. In Black and White 2, Latios found itself contributing more on defense. It was one of the few Pokemon capable of checking Keldeo, who immediately became a top tier threat upon its release, and players began to switch out Trick for Sleep Talk, which allowed Latios to reliably check sleep inducers like Breloom, Amoongus, and even Hypnosis Politoed, turning the tables on what would otherwise be essentially a KO, instead of turning it into an opportunity to bombard the other team with its powerful attacks. Eventually, sleep moves were banned, and Latios went back to using Trick, making it even more difficult to deal with. Some players also experimented with Calm Mind Dragon Gem sets, which needed a turn to set up. But that wasn't hard to find given Latios' excellent defensive profile, and the payoff was absolutely nuclear. Even Tyranitar could crumble. While Latios was always annoyed by the presence of Tyranitar and its pursuit, it managed to succeed in spite of that hindrance, mostly because Tyranitar struggled to switch in to begin with. Plus, Latios weakening Titar was a 
core strategy for many sand teams attempting to clean up with Alakazam, or to gain a significant advantage in the weather war for rain teams. Eventually, gems were banned, and this strategy was no longer possible. But it didn't even matter, as Latios had shifted to running Culberberry sets, which were utterly huge in changing the dynamic it had against Tyranitar. No longer did it have to fear getting wiped out immediately upon switching out, and being able to bring Latios back in for what was almost surely another KO was game changing. Some Latios variants also ran the old Combine Dragon Gem variant, but with Lumberry attached instead, allowing it to upend any attempts to burn or toxic it, letting it become possibly the single best rain killer in the tier. As a matter of fact, many players considered Latios ban worthy throughout the generation. They believed it wasn't healthy that it forced every team to carry. Tyranitar, who struggled to switch in safely, or Ferrothorn, who needed rain to be truly safe from Hidden Power Fire. Even something like Specially Defensive Jirachi didn't enjoy taking Specs Surf and Rain. Latios didn't wind up being banned, but there was no denying its power, both as one of the Gen 5 metagame's top Pokemon, and in a more literal sense, with the utter force behind its mighty metagame warping Draco Meteor. It was so good, you could pretty much always bring Latios, and there wasn't much of anything your opponent could do about it. Indeed, some players did spam Latios in just about every game, believing it to be a disadvantage if they wouldn't do so, since they saw it as OU's unmatched number one Pokemon in the tier. Latios didn't participate in black and white Ubers thanks to Soldu being unavailable, but Soldu was released in Black and White 2, and Latios rejoined the tier with the same ferocious fervor of the previous generation. It welcomed the new additions of Reshiram, Zekrom, and Curum White. They were just additional slower Pokemon, which in this case translates to Draco Meteor victims. It was incredibly difficult to switch into, especially with Spikes up, and Spikes were everywhere thanks to the incredible Ferrothorn. Latios's brutal side shocks were almost as fearsome as its Draco Meteors, given how they plowed through metagame stalwarts such as specially defensive Kyogre and fighting Arceus. Of course, Draco Meteor was as dangerous as ever, ripping through just about everything. Even the incredibly popular new Genesect could only switch in once despite its resistance. And so Generation 5 saw Latios as a top tier Pokemon in the highest tier once again. Gen 5 was when Latios got promoted from high speed to supersonic. With the addition of gems, Latios' Draco Meteor went from a daunting attacking option to a targeted tactical removal, capable of vaporizing anything that dared to stand in its way. Latios still had a bunch of competition for the spot of top dragon though, including Garchomp and Salamence, but its status as the fastest Drake, along with its sibling, ensured it always had a spot at the top levels of play, especially with its usual partners of Hitmontop and Cresselia. Latios could round out its arsenal with a good amount of coverage moves, including Ice Beam, its choice of hidden powers for Scizor or Heat Ran, and either Psychic or Psy Shock for additional stab power, usually Psy Shock to hit the opposite side of the spectrum. To be honest though, the coverage was nice, but Latios was used for one thing. Draco Meteor Machine go burr. Latios certainly had his counters, chief among them Tyranitar, but its ability to constantly threaten at least one Pokemon on the field was still top notch. However, Latios's ubiquitous presence ended up being the the origin of its Achilles heel as well. While Latios's Draco Meteors were strong, its reliance on Dragon Gem made it somewhat one-dimensional in what it could accomplish. And if you could live through the initial barrage of Meteors, the special attack drop coupled with the fact that Latios had already expended its item meant its power was severely reduced. As the 2012 meta progressed, every trainer worth their salt started specking their Pokemon to live a timid Latios's Draco Gem boosted Draco Meteor. It became the go-to benchmark you check before anything else when building your team. If you go look at team reports from that era, it was uncommon to see a Pokemon that wasn't calc to survive Latios. As such, some players, such as future world's runner-up Jody Azarelli, would sometimes run a modest Latios to meddle with those calcs, but you had to be wary of making such a switch. Latios may be the fastest dragon, but it's not by an overwhelming amount. Dropping Timid meant you risked being outrun by fast Salamence and Garchomp, a potentially game-losing difference. Despite players adapting to its offensive power, the standard Dragon Gem Latios was still a force to be reckoned with and put up results to match. Matt Bears Fan 092 say Bolden won the Philly Regionals with a standard Latios on a team focused on substitute, while Benjamin Gadashke 
placed top four at the UK Nationals, and both German Nationals winner Stefan Maria and runner-up Mark Clampt had Latios on their team. Sure enough, Latios showed up in full force at Worlds. Nugget Bridge founder Scott Glaza was able to use it to place 10th, only bubbling out of top cut due to his opponent's win percentage, and Latios also had three other placements in the top eight. Matt and Fuego Coil placed six using it on his reign team, while the Spanish duo of Guillermo Castilla Diaz and Abel Martin Flash Sans placed seventh and third respectively. Flash made an interesting choice of a last move for his Latios, bringing energy ball for coverage against the pesky bulky water types that might otherwise threaten his team, as well as for a bit of extra oomph against Tyranitar without burning his Draco. Latios may have been soaring in 2012, but it really took off in 2013. Standard Draco Gem Latios continued to put up impressive results at the regional level, including Simon Yip's fourth place in Virginia, Dewey Ha's runner-up performance at Utah, and Jacob Burrow's Long Beach win. These placements showed off some of Latios' additional options, such as Thunderbolt and Helping Hand. Ben Gold would go on to showcase a light screen substitute Latios on his way to top eight at UK Nationals, which was far from Latios' only national spot. Spotlight. Latios also had three other top eight finishes at the UK Nationals, courtesy of Rachel Anand, top four finisher Lee Pravos, and none other than Abel Martin Sanz in the silver medal position. Other top national showings include Peter Sales fourth in Australia. However, there was one man more devoted to Latios than any other, well devoted to his entire team. Randy R. Inanimate Qua used the same set of six Pokemon for almost the entire season, piloting his squad of Latios, Excadrill, Togekiss, Tyranitar, Brillum, and Bisharp to repeat success, starting with his win at the Salem Winter Regional, which he followed up on by winning the January Online International Challenge. In these instances, Randy used a pretty standardish Latios, sporting Dragon Gem and a helping hand in Latios's last cover slot to help out the rest of his team. However, Randy was unsatisfied with Latios's reliance on his one-time burst of power, and so he made an additional innovative change that pushed his Latios to new heights. While the stars of Randy's teams were undoubtedly his Mold Breaker Extra Drill and Support Togekiss, his new Latios was critical to his success as well. Come US Nationals, Randy switched to Life Orb Latios, a countermeasure to the specific benchmarks people were hitting to counter Dragon Gen. While Life Orb wouldn't push Latios' damage past those benchmarks, it let it have a more consistent offensive presence with Psy Shock, dealing out good damage even when using its highest degree of firepower. Randy took that team to fourth at Nationals, building on his success earlier in the season. There was also one other notable notable attempt to circumvent the new normal of prepping for Dragon Gem. VGC Mechanics Mastermind Leonard de Wobblefett crafts 9th place at the St. Louis Winter Regionals. While Leonard didn't make top 8, his unique Latios bears mentioning. We've seen modest Latios before, but what Leonard did was to take for granted that he'd be outsped and shift all of his other EVs into bulk. This on its own wouldn't help, as Latios would still get obliterated by Dragon types now faster than it, even with the extra bulk. What Leonard did was to pair that extra bulk with Tailwind, letting Latios Latios resume its status as the fastest dragon around once set up. Even faster than Scarf users or other speed creeping mons that would have beat Timid Latios before and with the extra power of a modest nature to boot. Leonard also ran Surf as a coverage move over a psychic move, letting Latios handle opposing Heatran and other steel types remarkably well. Come world championships, Latios was still everywhere, in fact 8th in usage at the tournament. While Randy Qua finished the season outside the top 16 at 18th place, Latios was on 4 of the top 16 teams, including Toler Webb's 12th place finish and Inosha Car's 6. However, the two top Latios were those that bucked the standard and tried something new. Ben Gold followed up on his UK Nationals top 8 with a 4th place finish at his first ever world, and while Ben had many unusual aspects to it, such as his lightning rod ride on, his Latios was no run-of-the-mill dragon gem spammer. Instead, Ben ensured that he would blow straight through his opponent's painstakingly crafted EV spreads, using his lack of a reliance on dragon Dragon Gem and additional covers moves to bring some unexpected power. But it wasn't even Ben who gave Latios its crowning achievement. Instead, it was Arash Omadi who took Latios to the pinnacle, storming out of Italy to win the world championships. Arash had his own trick up his sleeve. Sunny Day Latios, recommended to him by Christopher Drug Duck Kugler. A trick you might remember from our video on the other Laddie, where Devin Ingram used the same strategy to take second at the US Nationals. With Sunny Day and Hidden Power fire, Latios was able to handle opposing steel types and 
and neuter rain teams, letting Arash's other innovative core of Mamoswine and Tornadus run wild in a matchup they nominally lose. Arash's visionary team building led him to the championship and showed that a little bit of twist on Latios could go a long way. The 6th generation brought about several significant nerfs to Latios. Its stab Draco Meteor previously feared for only having 1 resistance in steel now faced the prospect of doing a whopping 0% as it collided with the new Pokemon completely impervious to its power, Fairy types, who threatened Latios back with super effective damage. Draco itself suffered a drop in base power, going from 140 to 130. Still a powerful hit, but the difference was significant. For example, Life Orb Meteor went from a guaranteed one hit KO from full health against Keldeo in Gen 5 to barely more than a 50 50 chance in Gen 6. Surf also took a hit from 95 to 90. Both these moves drops meant Tyranitar had a significantly easier time against Latios, and specially defensive Heatran was more effective in pivoting around it as well. Hidden Powers drop from 70 to 60 also meant that Ferrothorn had an easier time taking a hit in a pinch, as well as newcomer Mega Scizor. This isn't even mentioning how Latios was now significantly strapped for moves slots. It really wanted Psy Shock or Psychic as it needed to rely on its secondary stab to hit fairies, mainly Clefable. Some players like Thunderbolt for Azumaro and Earthquake for Heatran, but that made it even harder to fit every move it wanted. It also absolutely had to fit Roost, as Latios's defensive qualities were massively important against metagame defining threats Keldeo and Mega Charizard Y, as well as pivoting back up against Landorus, Thunderous, and Mega Manetric. Finally, Latios's access to Defog was fairly rare, and many teams wanted to make use of it. Plus, it could backfire, given the popularity of Bisharp. Draco Meteor and Roost were required, and from there it was a pick-your-poison type deal, as it had to choose which Pokemon it could struggle with, and none of its targets were Pokemon one could generally just brush off. As if all that wasn't bad enough, Knock Off received a significant buff and meant the Landorus and Thunderous that Latios was tasked with helping against could potentially just one-hit KO it. Incredibly enough, in the face of all these hindrances, Latios not only got by, but one more became a top tier OU Pokemon. It was still strong, it was still fast, it was still able to switch in on and threaten out a significant number of dangerous threats from where it could batter away at the opposing team. It wasn't instantly throttling entire teams, but it managed to muscle through and pose a threat regardless, most notably against offensive teams, especially if it had coverage. Offensive teams with the Keldeo, Landorus, Thunderous, Mega Charizard Y structure were incredibly popular and seriously struggled with Latios if it HP fired their Bisharp. It just kept getting better throughout XY as Aegislash and Mega Mawile were banned and by the end of the metagame, it was a nigh essential Pokemon on balance and offense teams alike. It just did so much and it did it well. Then Oras came around and Latios' Mega Evolution actually did very little for its place in the metagame. It didn't change enough about Latios to be worth taking up a Mega slot, so most players just continued to use standard Life Orb Latios and were better off for it. Latios as a whole didn't change too much for a while. The new Mega Metagross was another effective pursuiter for it, but it also had to be wary of switching into HP fire before Mega evolving. It did enjoy Landorus being banned, as it no longer had to dance around the possibility of its knockoff. Eventually, players decided to eschew Latios's Roost, given its propensity for getting trapped, and tried to make it dish out as much damage as possible before it went down. This gave rise to Choice Specs, which quickly established itself as an excellent set, not least because its psychic cleanly to it killed the otherwise safe check Clefable. Since it wasn't strapped for moves, slots, it could even fit Defog in the last slot, allowing it to maintain its potentially crucial hazard removing utility. Sometime later, Choice Scarf variants also rose in popularity. They were able to check the immensely dangerous Dragon Dance Mega Charizard X, could cripple Clefable with Trick, and were generally adept cleaners, being able to mow down usually faster Pokemon like Weavile and Weaken Tornado Sterian. Overall, Latios was an incredibly important Pokemon in Gen 6 OU. Despite facing more hurdles than ever before, it retained a crucial position in the metagame, being a critical part of the tier's defenses against the various threats inhabiting it, and managing to pose a serious offensive threat even in the face of nerfed base powers and fairy types. In Ubers, it was the same story as the previous generation. Latio sat out of XY due to its absence of Sodu, then joined the fray with renewed vigor upon its items release in Oras, acting as a crucial offensive check to the now primal Kyogre and Groudon. It was difficult to safely wall. This effect once again exacerbated 
countermanded by spikes, those being laid by Clef Key this time around. Speaking of, Hidden Power Fire plowed through any Clef Key looking to soak up Latios' Draco meter, and Side Shock also did quite a number to it, as well as seriously smacking Cocky Xerneas. Latios' defensive presence was as crucial as ever, and it allowed it to generate turns to throw out its fearsome offense. As such, it was once more an integral part of Aura's Ubers. Latios' return to VGC in 2015 brought it back down to earth a bit. For one thing, its coveted title of fastest dragon in the west, or anywhere, had been snatched from it by Mega Salamence. For another, even though the most successful Latios in 2013 hadn't run Dragon Gem, the threat of Dragon Gem existing was a huge part of what made those sets work, and so the removal of Latios' signature item was another blow to the chest. And as if that wasn't enough, the way typing shook out wasn't great for Latios either. Fairy types were a problem for Latios, but they also reduce the amount of fighting types around, meaning that Latios' psychic type wasn't quite the pretty penny it had been before. Now you might be asking, what about Latios' Mega Evolution? Unfortunately, Mega Latios' awkward stat distribution made it a less than great choice for the Mega slot, especially when compared to its younger sibling. Meanwhile, the popularity of Mega Mawile posed a dire problem for Latios, which had to contend with its worst nightmare typing and destructively powerful sucker punches. Nevertheless, a few players still found ways to put Latios to good use, and it had a good share of regional appearances. Colin the Battle Room Hair gave it a 5th place finish at Virginia Winter Regionals, while over in Brisbane, Aaron Nunt gave it a top 8 finish in Italy. Giovanni Milani was able to give Latios another regional victory. Special mention has to go to Eden Bachelor for innovation, whose sash tailwind hidden power ground Latios took enemies by surprise to garner a top 8 finish at the UK Regionals and a top 64 finish at Nationals. However, Nationals were a good litmus test on how Latios was doing, and the results weren't too positive. Latios didn't top cut a single national in the Masters division, although Ben Piercy did manage to take home the US Nationals Seniors division, with a scarf Latios that rounded out his unique team of Salamence, Needle Queen, Breloom, Volcarona, and Scizor. Worlds was only further confirmation that Latios' star was setting. Although three players brought it to Worlds, none put up a significant result, and Latios ended 2015 on a low note. In Gen 6, Latios was top tier OU while completely shunning its mega form. In Gen 7, the roles reversed as Mega Latios quickly became the only Latios. This mainly stemmed from the fact that the larger pool of threats expanded the metagame, shifting it away from the mega centric focus of Gen 6. Most teams did not even bother with the mega, so Latios wasn't bringing any sort of negatively skewed opportunity cost upon its team, as that was the reason it didn't use its mega form in the previous generation. Of course, it appreciated the boost to both defenses as well as having knockoff significantly softened against it. Mega Latios had great defensive utility, able to effectively check massive threats like Kartana and Z Heatran, staying healthy with Roost, while being able to significantly threaten a ton of teams with utmost ease thanks to its power and coverage, such as its meaty psychic that smashed Toxapex without being walled by Clefable or the Tapus. Another huge part of this came from another excellent boost it got in its mega form, that to its attack, which allowed it to run Earthquake effectively. It absolutely shattered Magirna, who was otherwise a perfect Latios counter. It also meant Tyranitar could no longer check it safely. It was incredibly difficult to safely check without Ferrothorn, Celesteela, or Mega Scizor, all three of whom were famously vulnerable to Magnezone. It could switch up its final attacking moves too. It generally liked having Ice Beam to destroy the ultra-threatening specially defensive Gliscor, as well as smacking Tapu Bulu as hard as possible. But any Reuniclus or Greninja looking to exploit a lack of Draco Meteor could just as well be in for an extremely nasty surprise. So overall, Mega Latios was a top tier threat once again, an Ultra Sun and Moon OU. As for Ubers, the nerfing of Soldu from a free calm mind to a measly 20% boost to its stats instantly killed Latios' role in the tier, and it was downright unviable. Weird nerf game freak, who was that helping again? Latios disappeared for all of Gen 7 VGC, his only notable placing coming from Jamie Boyd placing 27th at Worlds. Great job to Jamie, but this being the only notable placement we could find shows how outclassed Latios has been since it was snuffed in 2016. Latios received quite the hype upon its release in Generation 8's Crown Tundra, having received absolutely incredible moves in Aura Sphere, yeah Tyranitar, eat your heart out, as well as Mystical Fire to replace Hidden Power, and Future Sight. Remember that Future Sight is now 120 base power, and the delayed damage sets up some powerful combination. For example, the opponent has to switch into a base 120 power stab move from a Specs Latios and another threat like Urshifu and his close combat at the same time, which is nearly impossible 
impossible to do safely. Furthermore, in addition to receiving those buffs, Latios was indirectly buffed by the fact that its greatest nemesis, Pursuit, had now been removed from the game. Who cares if Tyranitar switches in and absorbs a Draco Meteor? Latios can just switch out and back in with its immunity to repeatedly bombard the opponent's team. It was quite hype, but in practice, it failed to live up to the expectations. Theoretically, there wasn't much it couldn't stuff, but in a real game scenario, it was all too easy to outplay with metagame stables like Assault Vest, Galarian Slowking, Corviknight, Clefable, and yeah, even the theoretically Aurasphere threatened set of Pokemon, Heatran, Tyranitar, Ferrothorn, and Melmetal. The offensive side of the metagame threatened Latios every which way as well. It wasn't going to find many opportunities in the face of Dragapult and Weavile tearing through everything, with Tapu Koko and Tapu Lele not helping matters much either. That was another problem. If you wanted a powerful, fast dragon type special attacker, you pretty much always just wanted to use Dragapult. Sure, Latios was stronger, but Dragapult's higher speed stat was just too important. What about Future Sight? Well, if you wanted that on an offensive Pokemon, you had Tapu Lele for the first time ever. Latios just couldn't fit into OU at all and dropped to Yuyu. And if that previous part brought you down, this next one should perk you back up. Latios in Yuyu was exactly as over the top destructive as it sounds. Latios had already had a short stint in the tier before Latios's arrival and effortlessly tore the tier apart with her life orb powered stab combination alongside mystical fire or thunderbolt before quickly getting banned. Now imagine Latios, which was pretty much the same except much, much stronger. Yep, the Yuyu player base didn't even bother. Latios barely even existed in the tier long enough to be used in more than a handful of games before getting axed. It was banned within an hour of dropping. Yes, you heard correctly. This is a strong contender for the fastest quick ban in Pokemon history, and it is fitting for such a titan. Sadly, Latios would never find any use in OU and just remain in UUBL. But hey, if you're gonna get banned this spectacularly, that's pretty good consolation. Latios' presence continued to dwindle even when it was allowed when the Crown Tundra DLC dropped. In Series 7, Patrick Carroll placed 9th with it at the Players' Cup 2 Oceana Qualifiers. Then in 2022, in Series 12, Xia Mengru aka Ryan got a very impressive 2nd place with Latios at the Taiwan Nationals. His Latios was mainly used to control speed with Tailwind or Icy Wind. It was used in the finals of that tournament to offset his opponent's speed boost from max airstreams. Congratulations to Ryan for the performance. And that's it, so how good was Latios actually? Well, throughout its career, it has epitomized the special attacking dragon type, from its early days in advance, where it dominated the tier without even needing a stab attack, to every subsequent generation, where it was just about never even seen without its trusty Draco Meteor. It was one of the best, most important Pokemon in Ubers, and every single generation until the Soul Dew it relied on was inexplicably ruined. But four generations of striking fear in the strongest Pokemon in the game is still amazing, to say the least. It also had a terrific career in OU, from its debatably ban-worthy debut in Gen 5, to overcoming a million and a half obstacles in Gen 6, to finally unleashing its mega forms potential in Gen 7. Generation 8 saw it slow down in a set of circumstances that were as bizarre as they were unfortunate. But hey, at least we got to see Latios get banned from UU in what might have been the fastest quick ban of all time. Overall, there's a reason that dropping a Draco is represented by Latios. It is the purest essence of the move. Go buy Joey's Drop a Draco merch right now. Thanks for watching everyone, and as always, if you liked the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content, and in the comments, I want to know what do you think about competitive Latios, what do you want it to have if it comes back to Gen 9, whatever it is, let me know in the comments, and thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos, and thank you to everyone else watching as well. and follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.